Hello everyone, my name is John, I'm the Geeky Fanboy and welcome to uh, this casual Doctor Who review. It's been a while since I've talked about Doctor Who uh, on this channel and I know I'm a bit late with some of these reviews but heck, we're here now. Uh, and today I'm here to do a casual review of the 2023 60th anniversary special starring David Tennant as the 14th Doctor. So this is a mashup for like all the specials that came out. So today I'm going to talk about the Star Beast, Up Beyonder, and the Giggle. This is uh, going to be more or less of a structured review. We're just here to like kind of chat, have some fun. I'm going to tell you a bit about what I thought while watching um, the specials. Obviously, some of these uh, aired a while ago, so not all of my thoughts are the freshest. But um, I'll do the best I can. As I said, this is more of a casual thing. Maybe. I don't know, put this on in the background if you want to have a feeling of someone talking to you about a thing they like. So, um, that's it. Um, for the introduction, I don't even want to talk that much. Let's just st jump straight into it with my thoughts on um, the Star Beast. Okay, the Star Beast is the return of David Tennant this time as the 14th Doctor. Uh, well, I wasn't... I was excited, but I was a bit nervous about David Tennant coming back because, I mean, I love David Tennant as much as the next guy, um, but I'm always a bit suspicious of, you know, actors returning in Doctor Who, like if it's about the Doctor themselves. So I, I was a bit suspicious of, nah, is this going to feel different in a good way, different in a bad way? Is it going to feel exactly the same as when David Tennant played the role for the first time? So let's just maybe talk about that at first. Um, well, of course, David Tennant is absolutely amazing in the role as the Doctor. He's, uh, he's always been um, not my favorite, but one of the Doctors I like a lot. And he obviously excels at the role and, and he brings a lot of energy to it and passion. As you can definitely tell that he loves stepping back into like playing this character. Uh, but my my one major criticism about this incarnation of the Doctor is that for me, it, the 14th Doctor didn't feel as distinguished enough from the 10th Doctor. You definitely had some differences here in that. The 14th Doctor feels a bit more emotionally refined and open about how um, he feels. He wears his heart a bit more on his, on his sleeve. He doesn't feel as dark and pompous as the 10th Doctor did. Like The 14th Doctor feels a bit more like he would actually talk to you about what's what's going on. He's a bit more honest about what he's feeling, about the trauma that he's gone through. Like, you could tell that there were, like, subtle differences there in that, that department, but the rest of the character, for me, felt still a bit too similar to the 10th Doctor. And I know that David Tennant can pull off, like, a variety of, of, of different character types, so I'm I'm putting this maybe more on the writing and the, and, and the directing, that for the most part, he plays the character almost exactly the same as he did um, like 15, over 15 years ago. Like I said, I mean, I, I like the 10th Doctor. Um, I like David Tennant on the role. I, I just wish we had a bit more like um, like different characteristics to this version of the Doctor, even though it was the same face. Like I, like I thought, okay, maybe he just has the same face, but completely, well, not completely, but like new personality. Like, But they just went with, yeah, no, he's he's still kind of, he's, he's basically kind of the same, just more emotionally refined because he's older. Um, so that's what, what this felt like. Um, it wasn't like bothering me too much. It's just something I noticed where I wish they had done a bit more with the Doctor as, as a character in general um, in, in, in these uh, specials. But yeah, let, let, now let's jump straight into uh, the Star Beast. Doctor meets Donna again. Donna, my favorite companion, 10th Doctor, uh, and Donna is still my favorite Doctor companion duo in the series. Um, Catherine Tate and David Tennant have amazing chemistry right off the bat again. Uh, I can't understand why they brought these two actors back for, you know, a 16th anniversary thing. Uh, I'm always delighted to see Donna. She, like I said, my favorite companion. Um, and she still feels exactly the same. I like what they do with her in these specials that you can see how she's now what she's now like as a as a mom, how um, she's dealing with her now having a daughter and being married and also being a bit more uh, direct and open with with her mom, who I think also changed a bit, which I liked. 
um because i think the relationship between donna and her mom is actually quite interesting i really loved seeing donna's relationship with her daughter especially like in this in this first special in the star beast um uh i wished we would have gotten a bit more about rose about the about the daughter of donna and a bit more uh, about her husband because her husband is fun when he's on screen but he barely like really does anything he's just kind of that because he he's funny because he doesn't know what's going on he's never heard of the doctor he doesn't know anything about like all the sci-fi nonsense that uh, it's been going on in donna's past so he's kind of the the straight man in in, in that regard so i wish we had we could have gotten a bit more of him and in regards to Rose, I, th I honestly thought she would play kind of a bigger role uh, than she ended up having. Because, um, especially since I thought, okay, she is going to be in... I don't know, for some reason I initially thought she's going to play like a bigger role, not just one episode, but maybe like all of the episodes. But no, she's only really like in this one, in, in, in the Star Beast. Um, and I like her character. I think she's definitely more than what some people have uh, wrongly said, that she, she's more than just a queer trans character, she's more than just that. Uh, you can feel that she has a lot of um, compassion and is very creative and smart and outspoken and opinionate, opinionated like her mother, which I quite liked. Um, the only thing I'll say in regards to like the trans representation, which in and of itself is of course great, it's always great to have um, trans characters, uh, on television, especially uh, especially in such big and important shows as Doctor Who. Uh, what I disliked about that attempt at re representation, though, was that I didn't like how they introduced um, the fact that Rose was trans, because how they basically made that clear for the first time to the viewer was having bullies dead name her on her way home. And I didn't like that. Like, yes, of course, it, it, it's important to, like, sort of reflect the... Um, reality of what trans people go through and unfortunately dead naming is one of the things that happens to a lot of trans people i just didn't like that this was literally like the first indicator that we got uh, for rose being trans i was like oh great cool yeah introduce us to the trans character or her transness by dead naming her out loud her actual dead name thanks that's exactly what i needed i, I I wish they could have kept um, this conversation Donna has with her mum as sort of like the, the first uh, indicator or hint towards the audience that uh, Rose is trans. Because I really love that conversation between Donna uh, and, and her mum. Because I felt it was very realistic that Donna's mum, uh, she's, she's a bit older and maybe she's not really like used to that yet because she didn't really encounter queer people had to do with uh, those kinds of things those kinds of people or themes when she was younger but you can tell that she's trying she's honestly trying to like um understand her granddaughter and and get the things right but you know sometimes you make mistakes sometimes you slip up and uh she uses the wrong pronouns and but immediately apologizes i i do like that conversation because it felt very realistic and and understanding and it, and it showed that um the grandma was putting in the effort i like that and i wish they sort of have, had kept that as like the introductory moment for indicating oh rose is trans uh also kind of i'm uh, slightly confused about the labels i mean obviously you don't have to have labels but um towards the end of the special when you know the meta crisis is re solved and all that and they have this thing with the binary and then rose says non-binary and it had me a little confused because we're like so is is, is rose non-binary is, is she a trans woman? Is she non-binary? I, I, I don't know, like the kind of confused me a little bit there. I mean, obviously, if you don't want to label yourself, you don't have to. It just, I don't know, the messaging was a bit muddled there. Um, but in, in general, I like, I like Rose's character. Uh, similar to the husband, I wish she had been a bit more important, but I like the focus that she got. I'll come back to like the, the resolution at the end of the episode. Uh, as to, you know, the, how the matter crisis is resolved and all that. Let's talk a bit about the, the story in general. I think the story was um, perfectly serviceable. I, I thought it was fine. Like, uh, to me, it wasn't anything like that great or but it also wasn't like really bad. I liked the meme. The meme was utterly adorable and I love 
um, the voice the meep got really had me like oh like a couple of times through <laughs> while I was watching the episode uh, even though obviously you could kind of tell at some point that you know something's gonna go wrong or weird with the meep right uh, uh, but yeah I, I, I do like that we get like a bit a little bit of red hair and you're like oh they're those hunters and they're trying to get the meep and you're thinking oh no but the meep is really cute so obviously we have to help the meep but then it turns out the meep is actually like a super space dictator um which i quite liked um as a twist and i always love this sort of cliche of you know something really really cute is actually like super evil and violent uh, it's a contrast I, I quite like and i think that also works quite well for doctor who because it's a bit more uh, uh on the camp Camp side of the campy side of things, which I quite like. Um, like the story was um, fine. I wish it had been a little bit more exciting because it just it felt a problem that I also had with the next special. It felt basically like just um, an extended normal episode of Doctor Who. Um, the only like real special focus was, of course, um, you know, Doctor reuniting with Donna and Donna regaining like her memories of the Doctor. Um, well, I do like the emotions that went with that as the scene happened, you know, the Doctor being like, if I, if I give you back your memory, we can save the world, but you'll die. Um, it was acted very well, so that's why it had a lot of emotion, but in the end, the whole resolution um, fell a bit flat for me, because um, I know, it just felt like it was sort of way from the side, because it used to be like this really big deal that Donna is never allowed to remember, otherwise she'll die, and then it's sort of like just waved aside and then we get this resolution with like you know the meta the, the meta crisis being resolved because donna had a kid and some of that energy went into her and that energy split up or i don't know I, i'm not quite sure what the explanation there was like but that's sort of how it worked because rose had part of that meta crisis energy within her as well and and i didn't really like how they eventually solved it because uh, well, what are you going to do? We can't really do anything about it. And and then uh, Donna and her uh, daughter are like, well, we're going to do what a male or male presenting doctor or whatever, a male doctor could have, what a man could never do, just let it go. And I have two problems with that. First off, they just literally let it go. Like this whole big thing that we've been hung up about for like over 15 years. So like if Donna remembers, she will die. That's like a huge deal. And then they're like, just let it go, man. Just let it go. And then it literally just like resolves itself. And Donna's fine. Felt a bit underwhelming. And my second issue with that is that I didn't like how, probably not on purpose, but it's sort of the implication was, you know, men are not as in touch with their emotions as femme people are so that's why we are able to do this and allowed to let go of something because you as a man or male presenting person are emotionally immature and have trouble letting go of your emotions or be vulnerable i didn't like that implication to be honest it, it, it again it probably wasn't on purpose but it left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth i was like oi like what the hell that's not really fair or a good message but yeah um that wasn't on purpose i know but it felt it still felt a bit iffy i don't know but that's how we sort of resolved that situation uh felt a bit underwhelming um that sort of general feeling i had for the episode it was okay not great it was kind of underwhelming especially because i was like we're celebrating the literal freaking 60th anniversary of one of the if not the longest running television show ever and this is the episode we're getting for that. It didn't really feel all that special, to be honest. Like, I didn't really um, get that feeling of, oh, we're celebrating, like, a really big thing here. Um, that's not really what that felt like. And, of course, at the end of the episode, some kind of mistake, some hijinks happen with it, within the TARDIS. And uh, the Doctor and I was left on to the next adventure. Last remark here on the new TARDIS design. I love it. I uh, I love that it is spaced out finally a bit of a bigger uh, TARDIS inside, which I quite like. Even though that shot of David Tennant like running along the TARDIS, 
took quite a while, and I think while they were shooting this, they were like, yeah, we can see the mistake here that we've made. Uh, you found that a bit, although I do quite like how big it feels. I like how the general design is very reminiscent of um, the classic Who TARDIS. Um, sort of more like the very wide, sterile kind of look, but uh, with a modern touch, like in the cons and everything, and later we also get a jukebox, which I quite like. Um, it definitely feels very um, different and distinguished which I think is always good for like a new Doctor and like sort of soft, um, not quite reboot, but you know, like a sort of soft new beginning for, for the show. So I quite like that. Okay, let's jump into the second special, Wobble Yonder. I think I'm going to have a, an unpopular opinion here, because from what I gathered as uh, when I f when I finished watching that and I looked at some general opinions and reviews I think a lot of people really really like this special like I I've seen so many people say that they think this is like one of the best episodes of Doctor Who in a in a while uh for some people in a really long time in literal years because you know 13th Doctor wasn't that good you know those kind of people but uh, and a lot of people were like wow this was finally like some really good freaking Doctor Who um, and I finished it and was like, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> like, it wasn't bad. By no means, it, it wasn't bad. I had some moments I really, really liked. So let's dive into it. The Doctor and Donna um, and on an ab seemingly abandoned spaceship. It's completely empty. And the TARDIS, sensing danger, just buggers off. The TARDIS is gone, along with the sonic screwdriver. And Doctor and Donna are left on this seemingly abandoned spaceship trying to find out what the hell the TARDIS went away from and how they can solve the problem so the TARDIS comes back. Which I think in general is a great premise because it immediately gives you like a sense of unease because you're like, oh shoot, so we know they can't be alone. We know that there is something lurking on this spaceship or space station. Which was a, a general feeling I, I immediately quite liked and I like that we sort of really do get the sense of unease and panic a bit in the very beginning because Donna is having a bit of a freak out and she like her and the doctor even have a bit of a fight and but then the doctor like tries to calm her down I like that I like the like the general mood setter there then we get onto like the the actual like spaceship the space station then I realized oh this episode is gonna look rough and I mean literally look rough because I know Doctor Who doesn't have the biggest budget, it's no Game of Thrones, I never expected that, and I'm used to the near CGI on the show, but the way this episode looked like really took me out of it, because I was like, oh, oh, we're working, that's the green screen and CGI we're working with in this, for 60 minutes, okay, it's gonna be, be a bit hard on the eyes, um yeah this looked awful in parts this looked really awful like to and i'm like usually the guy i'm like i don't care what it looks like like if it's a bit old if it's shoddy cgi usually i don't really care that much but in that case i don't know why in that case it, like it really took me out of it I, they were standing in this like corridor of the space station i was like what am i looking at i don't know it just really took me out um the problem with the shoddy CGI also came back later with like the the not things like the evil entities they were fighting, because um, I, I get that they were supposed to look weird and make you feel uneasy and creeped out, but to me it wasn't. They didn't feel as I looked at them. They didn't make me feel like uneasy in a good way. They made me feel uncomfortable in a bad way because I was like, oh oh oh, honey, those special effects went a bit wrong, didn't they? Oh, darling, no. What are, what, are, what are we doing here? That's sort of what that felt like. I was like, oh, I hate looking at this because it just looks awful from a technical standpoint. I don't know. Just, I don't, I don't know what the problem was here. For me, it just, it, it really took me out of it in like parts of the episode because in, in general, I think the premise for this was great and the villains, I think, in general, were a really good idea and quite creepy. Um... Because it feels very much like a bottle episode and you just have two entities that look exactly like our main characters. Uh, also, I love it when actors have to like essentially play each other, but like a different version, um, which I quite like. And um, 
I, I like the hints there of, of creepiness that you got with like when the Doctor and Donna were split up and you couldn't tell who are they talking to now. Are they talking to the actual real authentic version? Are they talking to the like non thing e not thing evil version? I I do like how that how that worked in dialogue. I really like how, how that worked out. But as soon as like things started to like literally physically look weird, I was put off in a bad way. I was like, oh no, this just looks this just looks weird. Why are we doing that? Um, I mean, I do appreciate that, like, for example, like the long arms and something like they weren't CGI. They were actually there. They, they were props. So that that's great. I, I love it when 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 um, TV shows and movies do that because also that didn't look bad because because I could tell those were props like that. Good. Keep keep doing that. Don't use CGI. Keep using more on set props. I love that. Um, I loved the dialogue that uh, that we had in this episode between uh, the Doctor and Donna, and also between like the evil entities and our, our actual main characters. One of my favorite conversations uh, in this was, which unfortunately eventually turned out to be between the real Doctor and the fake Donna, was the Doctor actually like talking about his trauma that he went through because um, of the flux and all, and half the universe died because of them. Um, that he's running away from it all because he feels guilty and all that. I really like that we worked through that and the Doctor is finally like facing those emotions that we don't, even though a lot of people didn't like the Jodie Whittaker era, uh, era that RTD isn't ignoring this, that no, this Doctor actually thinks about this and is emotionally impacted by this and even traumatized by this and we are talking about the flux and all that and uh, the timeless child. We, have, we haven't forgotten about it, we are talking about it and I like that. I like that whole conversation where where the doctor is being honest about his feelings and he's being very vulnerable and and open. Then and unfortunately, it turns out that he was having this conversation with the fake Donna, which to me undermined the whole emotional basis a bit. But in general, I thought that was a good idea. Um, what I liked as well as the conversation was um, the doctor, the real doctor and Donna, um, when they got to the head of the space station and they had. Like this conversation about what the end of the universe looks like that there's like no starlight it's just like complete absence like the ed literal edge of the universe where nothing exists and doctor just like sort of points and says that's where your family is and, and donna just has this sort of uh, almost like existential crisis about her being at the edge of the universe of space and time and her family is like millions billions of light years away maybe probably even dead and and her fear about how long are they gonna wait for her. like I, I the again that felt very like emotionally deep and i like when doctor who acknowledges those kinds of feelings especially for um the companions they do leave people behind that it must be and like for the doctor it must be very weird for them to suddenly like be billions and billions of life years or millions of years away from their home how just like mind-boggling that must feel to the human mind i, I really like that conversation between the Doctor and Donna. And then of course like the uh, whole thing with uh, with the evil entities happens, um, they start to copy the Doctor and Donna, which uh, in general is a, is a concept I always kind of enjoy, you know, uh, evil versions or evil copies of the characters that we've known, uh, that we've known for a long time. Um, There's a concept I, I in general quite enjoy. Um, but in the end it sort of um, ended up being, you know, we need to explode the space station and we're gonna run down this really shitty looking corridor for 10 minutes and again that felt sort of a bit underwhelming i didn't really because i thought we were gonna have a bit more of a thoughtful solution to the whole problem than you know the evil fake doctor and donna like just turn big and start growing teeth and they run like dogs along the hallway and it just felt a bit weird and and a bit off and I, and I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it. I do admit that it was a little bit surprising that um, they actually went for, you know, the doctor picking up the, the wrong uh, Donna because I, I, I was expecting that, well, of course, the doctor's going to realize he, he, he has uh, the wrong Donna. Uh, it did actually take him longer than, than, than I thought it would, um, to be honest, even though you know, we get another sort of like Donna fake out scene like we did in the first special. Um, but I mean, of course, at the end of the day, you know that Donna is probably uh, not going to die also because you know that she's going to be in the third special. Um, 
it was, it felt sort of Deus Ex Machina-ish when the TARDIS came back. Because, I mean, at that point in time, the danger wasn't over yet. Like, the creatures were still on board, or at least, you know, the space station was literally exploding in the middle of nowhere at the edge of the universe. That's still mortal danger. Why is the TARDIS coming back now and bringing them back? I don't know, felt a bit weird. Um... Yeah, they get into the TARDIS, come back to Earth, um, all hell is breaking loose on Earth. We get to see Wilfred. I cried, okay? I cried because I love Bernard Cribbins. And rest in peace, old man. Okay, it was so nice to see him. Because, oh, Wilfred is like such a good man. And knowing that this was like the last thing Bernard Cribbins uh, film, I'm sure like, it was just chuck up my heartstrings. Uh, but it's definitely like a good cliffhanger ending there at the end that, you know, you feel like they were just gone for like a couple of days. And we only get this hint like throughout the episode that the Doctor is like, oh no, I, I invoked a superstition at the edge of the universe. It's probably going to come back to haunt us. And then you come back to Earth and suddenly all hell's breaking loose. And then you realize, oh yeah, shit's actually going down now. Um, which leads us straight in into um, the third special. So yeah, Wobble Yonder is... For me, it was a bit of mixed bag. I liked it a tiny bit more than, than the Starbeast because I was actually a bit more engaged with what was going on. Though I have to say, it, the episode was dragging for me a bit. Sort of like the first episode, probably on the felt a bit like um, a, gen, a, a, a general Doctor Who episode. Like a premise for a normal 45, 50 minute long episode. But it was stretched out to like an hour, which it really didn't need. Because like after 50 minutes, I was like starting to look at my watch and be like, Oh, we're still going to be here for like over 10 minutes. Okay, I felt like it didn't need that for, it didn't have enough meat. Um, so I did like it, but I didn't think it was great. It had a couple of things where I was like, you could have really done that differently. And holy wow, that episode looks weird. So I think I'm a bit in a minority thinking here that um, this wasn't like really that great. Like it was entertaining, but it really wasn't that good. So um, yeah. I don't know. Let, let me know if, if I'm in the minority here uh, with this opinion. Um, but for now, let's jump into the third special, The Giggle. Okay, so let's talk about The Giggle. The Giggle was my favorite out of the three specials we got with the 14th Doctor. And it also introduces us to the 15th Doctor, to Shuti Gawas Doctor, which I was quite excited about. So let's jump into it. Uh, well, first off, we got Neil Patrick Harris as the toy maker. Uh, a villain that we're only really familiar with, I think, from a lost Doctor Who episode from the classic era. Um, so it was a villain I, uh, I had heard of, I was aware of, but didn't really know that much about uh, before going into this episode. So this is sort of the first uh, incarnation I got of, uh, of this character. Um, Neil Patrick Harris, you can tell, has so much fun with, uh, with this character. He like, brings a lot of camp and cheesiness and but like also a great sense of like chaotic uh, weirdness and evilness to the character, which like immediately you can feel you can feel immediately like within the the, the first couple of minutes of of the episode. Um, in regards to the accent, um, I felt slightly put off by uh, by the 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 German because you know guy who lives in Germany. Is a lot of German, reads German. Um, it, I know it's super nitpicky, but the entire time my brain was like, I'm hearing your grammatical errors in your German, Neil. I'm hearing all of it, and I don't like it because it, it's not grammatically correct. <laughs> it's, it's really nitpicky. It's really nitpicky. That was just my brain while watching the whole time because I was like, that's not how you would say that but okay no <laughs> i mean it's supposed to be weird and uh and and, and kind of off-putting so really just i was just like my brain nitpicking as, as you do when you know when when you're uh when you're multilingual and you know just a language and you hear it in a, in, a, in a different uh in a different language while someone tries to be and you're immediately kind of picking up on what they're doing wrong it's just like my part of the brain because it doesn't matter it was funny but i i, I had times where i was like that's not how you say that um, I thought it was a funny idea with like sort of switching up the accent. He also like sipped into British and, and his natural American at times to sort of make certain points, 
which I quite like because it felt like it added more to the chaotic energy of of the character, and he was like that he would be like, well, I just feel like it right now because it's fun. So that's just like what I'm doing right now. Um, also because I read that the theory some people had was like that in the original episode, the Doctor outwits the toy maker originally by copying the toy maker's voice. So maybe switching the accents was a way for the toy maker to like not have that happen again, which I think would be kind of a neat, um, neat idea if, if, if that theory turned out to be true. But in general, I think the toy maker was a fun uh, villain character to have around. Definitely a lot of campy, chaotic energy. Uh, of course, they gave Neil Patrick Harris uh, a musical number. Love that. Just like in the middle of the episode, jumps out at you the headquarter. Uh, there's a lip sync and dance along to I think it was a Spice Girls song and just buggers off again. You're like, what the hell? But it fits right in. It's like that's like classic camp camp Doctor Who. I love it. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris is playing the hell out of it. Um, I love it. I. The only thing I didn't like is how the character went out, uh, basically, how he was defeated. Um, I'll probably come back to that later, but, you know, it all com just comes down to a rather unclimactic game of, you know, catch. And then the top makes like, oh, I lost. And then he lands in a box and that's it. I don't know. I, w I, w I wish he had uh, had gotten a bit more of a uh, bombastic ending. I don't know, it would have fit the character a bit more, uh, I think. But... Uh, Great character, I think, was, was a fun villain to have around and definitely felt appropriate for like a big uh, final send-off for Doctor and potentially maybe also a villain for a future episode. We don't know, he might come back. In general, I enjoyed um, the pacing and the general vibe of this episode more than I did with the other two because you could really tell that there was a lot of tension, there were um, stakes, there were new story beats and new character things happening every couple of minutes and it definitely kept your uh, kept your attention because the whole time you're wondering what the hell is going on what's the toy maker doing he's really weird why the hell is he doing that how's the doctor gonna get out of that one? Oh no what's donna doing now like there was always something going on that are uh, um that you know sort of grabbed my attention uh and sort of guided me along uh and me along with like the characters and what they were doing um, especially like once, as soon as like the doctor sort of realizes what might be going on, and they travel to the past to confront the toy maker, and the doctor realizes what the hell's actually going on, you can immediately tell along because the doctor's reacting to this so well because he's shocked, and like when the doctor is shocked and in terror, you immediately know, oh, fuck, this must be like a really, really, really bad thing if even the doctor is freaking out about this, and and I love that we basically kept this tension almost throughout the entire episode. Um, I love the whole thing with like the, doc the doctor and Donna getting lost in the toy maker's house. Super creepy puppets. Like I was this time, I was properly weirded out by um, uh, weird looking people and puppets. Like this whole thing with um, uh, Donna meeting like this this puppet family coming out of the shadows. Super creepy. I'm like, get the hell out of here. I do not need creepy puppets in my life. I'm not going to sleep tonight. That 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 definitely worked as well. Um, I love the whole puppet show that the toy maker stages for the Doctor and Donna, where he explains what happened to past um, a companions of the Doctor that Donna doesn't know about, to sort of show that's what's been happening to them. Those are the fates that uh, have befallen them, and the Doctor's always trying to like sneak in this. Yeah, but yeah, but they're alive, or yeah, but. It actually turned out well for them in the end. The toy maker's like, well, that's all right then, isn't it? Because, you know, it's all, it almost sounds like the, the toy maker's like calling him out for, for, for being like, oh, well, he always like, almost like the doctor always has an excuse for, 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 for like what he's doing to, to uh, his companions. I sort of uh, thought that was very interesting. Then, you know, we have the doctor challenging him to a game which the toy maker wins, but of course, which I quite like, it's the callback to Classic Who. Um, he's like, well, no, I won that time, you won this time, best out of three. Which um, brings us back to Unit. Um, at Unit, I always love seeing Kate. Uh, I think she's a great character. I always love having her around. We get a cameo from an old companion, which I always like when you get cameos from old companions, even though in this case she didn't really do anything important or plot relevant but it was sort of nice to have her have, have that short moment with the doctor where they sort of like catch up uh and and say what's been going on um just wish that her character had been a bit more important that's it um and then we get we jump a bit forward to um 
the toy maker infiltrating like the uh, the un unit headquarters he takes over the, the the space laser essentially and then it comes down uh, to like this confrontation between the doctor and the toy maker and the doctor is like well your beef is with me is with me attack me leave them out of it and the toy maker just straight up lasers him through the chest i was like whoo i was not expecting that but okay just like straight up lasering him through the chest why not um and then we get something that I'm not sure how I feel about it. Um, so the doctor is like, well, this regeneration feels a bit different. And he literally gets pulled apart. He gets pulled in two. So we have David Tennant, 14th doctor. And then Shuti Gabo's doctor. And they're just like ripped apart. And we have two doctors. And it's called a bi-generation. And I don't know how I feel about it. I'm still trying to make up my mind about it, if I like it or not. Maybe I'm sort of neutral in the middle at the moment, still trying to like wrap my head around it. Um, what the good thing about that was that it gives us some absolutely wonderful like emotional moments between the two doctors, because it essentially feels like the doctor is giving himself therapy and emotional stability like the finally the sort of sense of relief that someone in this case the old doctor 15th doctor basically just tells us all the version is like it's okay i understand what you're going through it's fine that you feel like this and it's okay that you're vulnerable and it's okay if you just need to step back and chill out like man you just need a break take your time and, like I, I really loved that. I f it felt really emotional, and like the doctor was being so honest and vulnerable with himself. Like, like the doctor was almost like becoming not quite like a father figure to himself, but you know, it, it, it kind, it, it kind of had that, had that vibe because because Shutika was doctor felt um, almost like a bit fatherly, like therapeutic. How he was consoling like David Tennant, fourteenth doctor, who was. I don't know if I think was still feeling very um, traumatized and emotion emotionally vulnerable by what had happened to him in the past, not just with the toy making the episode, but like in Jodie Whittaker's era and, and all that, because he's like so, so old now. He's been doing this for such a long time. He's uh, He carries the guilt of like so many deaths that have happened in his name or that other people have uh, caused because of him. And it, it, I don't know, it just felt really cathartic to like sort of have himself acknowledge that to himself and be like, I know how you feel and it's okay for you to express those feelings and talk about them. Like it was for the, it almost felt like for the first time he's sort of acknowledging to himself or accepting himself that he is feeling those things and that it's okay to go through whatever he's going through. It just felt really, really nice. And... Right off the bat, Shuti Gawa's doctor, I'm probably going to come back to him in a moment anyway, um, immediately great energy. Like, he comes out and you're immediately feeling his vibe. You're like, yep, that's our new doctor right there. You I, At least for me personally, I was immediately like sort of vibing with him. I was like, he's definitely got the energy. He's definitely got the energy you need to, for, that you like expect from a doctor. That he immediately sort of has um, the the charisma to like sort of command the room like I, I felt like shooting out in that scene and I have like the final scene on where they were playing catch like even um was was stealing the spotlight like from David Tennant and Neil Patrick Harris like he was taking over that scene as soon as he was there and you mean like drawn 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 to his personality I think which I really really like because I think it's always a sort of important thing for like a new doctor to immediately make like a good impression uh on the audience and for me that it's definitely what happened here and then they have the scene where they play catch which i'm not quite sure how i feel about it i mentioned it a bit earlier like it felt a bit anticlimactic how, how the uh, toy maker goes out because they just play a weirdly edited scene of catch and then suddenly out of nowhere the toy maker just doesn't happen to catch the ball and he loses and that's how they save the day and it it felt anticlimactic. It didn't feel like they they, they earned that. I, I, I wish they had played a different game, not like something like catch and then in a weirdly edited scene with like no 
real climax or anticipation. It just like throws some balls. It's a bit weird. Like the doctors could even eliminate themselves, which would not be beneficial in that case. And then the toy maker just happens to lose somehow out of nowhere. And then he's just gone. I don't know. I, I wish they had done this a, a, a bit differently. Like different game where they had set up the whole ball catch game a bit differently. I don't know. I, um, it just was over way too quickly and with no like not no great fanfare sort of. I was expecting a bit more there. But at least with this one, with this in general, the, the story that was being told in the atmosphere we had in this uh, special at least gave me the feeling of yes, we are watching an important story, we're watching an anniversary a special. This is a regeneration story by generation story. This actually felt special, unlike the other two episodes, which to me just felt like extended normal episodes. This one actually felt special and warranted the 60 minute runtime. So, Toymaker defeated, the by generations happened, and what what happened now is that essentially the 15th Doctor, so Shujigawa, says to David Tennant, it's like, I'm going to go have adventures. My man, you need to take a break. You need, you have issues you need to work through. You've been on the run and doing adventures your entire life. And now you just need to have a sit down and just live, like live a normal life. And what I, in general, I like that idea for the character of the Doctor. Uh, I don't, I don't quite like how the show acts like the do Doctor never had a sit down or just lived. Because that has happened. Like, after Amy and Rory died, Matt Smith, the 11th Doctor, literally, like, settled down on Trenzalor for hundreds, or, I don't know, thousands of years. He became old. Like, he lived a life. And he spent, I think, like, over 20 years or something with uh, River Song before her uh, final mission. Um, the Doctor, also Peter Capelli's version, um, spent... A good, a good amount of time, like just being a teacher at a university, just being a relatively normal guy at a school. Uh, I just didn't like how the show seemed to ignore that. You know, the doctor has kind of had breaks before, but I do get the the, the general message, and I, and I do like the general idea of you know, you know, you've been through so much shit in your life, you need therapy. Go and have a break and work on your stuff, it's okay if you do that. Like, stop ignoring your feelings and just work through some shit and live. I, I, I just, I don't know, I, I, I liked it, it was really well acted, like, it, I, don't, I don't know if, I mean, I'm emotional in, in general, but it, 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 he even had me, like, a tiny bit teary-eyed, because the chemistry between the two doctors worked really, really well, and I just like that sort of, like, fatherly or advisory a vibe that Shudi Gawa's doctor had towards David Tennant's doctor. Where I was like, I get it. Chill. Just go and do things. Do normal stuff. You deserved it and you need it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just like that general idea that it was like, it's okay to, to face your feelings. It's okay if you feel like you need to take a break. If you need to take a break, take a break. You can't always do everything all the time. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> You can't always do that. Like sometimes you need to take a break and look after yourself and just spend some time maybe doing nothing or just hanging out with the family for once. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I, in general, I, I, I kind of like that idea. Um, though it had me a little bit confused as to, you know, what does that mean now? Does that mean like, obviously Shuti Gawa's doctor is now the 15th doctor. He's the one we're following. But does that mean David Tennant's doctor is like a completely... Does that just mean that there are, like two doctors now exist at the same time? And I don't just mean like a past and a present, but like because this feels like it's like two versions of the doctor exist at the same time. Does that mean like David Tennant's doctor just goes on to live like a normal time lord and eventually if he wants to he regenerates and then he also turns into the 15th doctor into Shooting Guard? Does he turn into a different doctor? Does he die? Can he still regenerate? Like does he do just, like, two different Doctors exist now at the same time? Like, how does that work? And... I don't know. Why is David Tennant the one who gets to have so many copies of himself? And he's the one who gets a happy ending? 
people just really seem to like David Tennant. And I mean, I totally get it. I absolutely get it. And I, I mean, it's nice that he gets to like just be with Donna and her family and gets to have a normal life, even though, you know, he has a second TARDIS as well. So it's basically just the normal Doctor Who shtick. He just lives a bit more of a quiet life. Um, I don't know, but it definitely leaves the back door open for like all those spin-offs, all the big Finnish audio dramas, all that will be there, definitely. And I know it's a bit of a meme that, you know, David Tennant's just going to come back every 10 years to do this. <laughs> I know he said he's not going to do it again, but it definitely left the back door open for that. And I wouldn't put it past him that he would be like, nah, come on, one more time. Because uh, we all love us some David Tennant, right? But, um... Yeah, Doctor Who's de definitely been giving him a lot of limelight, you know, for for his incarnation, or two incarnations, however you want to see that. And now he's the one who gets to have a happy ending. And I don't know, I still feel a bit weird about it. Obviously, I'm happy when the Doctor gets to be happy, but I also still feel weird about this whole um, by generation thing, how that works and what we're going to do now. Um... I mean, we're gonna follow uh, Shruti Gabor's Doctor now. Uh, I already said it. I absolutely adore his energy. I love what we're getting. I love that he seems to be... That he has... What I love about the Doctor, he definitely has this energy of that he feels like a... Um, childish, playful, cocky, young person with the mind... Um, the memory and the knowledge of a very, very wise old person. Because he definitely brings that energy, as you can see, like to, towards his young, uh, towards his younger version, to, towards the 14th Doctor, very, very almost father like advisory, where he's like, I'm, a, I'm the emotionally mature one, I get it, we talk about it. But at the same time, you definitely get this energy of, oh, we're doing some weird stuff, darling, we're doing some weird stuff here. You can definitely tell that this classic combination of like, the Doctor's personality is like definitely comes together here in Shuri Gawa's version. Um, what I've seen from the trailer for the Christmas special definitely looks great. Um, I already love the the costume design we get for Shuri Gawa's Doctor with like the orange and the leather coat. Looks great. Looking forward to it. He has some um, great energy. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing more of him um, in the future. We'll also get um, a new companion as well for the Christmas special. Well. We'll see how that uh, works out, but yeah, for now, those were uh, three specials. Um, for me, they were all okay. None of them were straight up bad, but I think it definitely became better with uh, it became better with each special. Like the first one um, was okay, not great, but it was okay. The second one, bit better. I don't think I liked it as much as most people. And the third one, great. I had a lot of fun with it. That one definitely felt like a. 60th anniversary regeneration special like the one we really needed like 60 minutes long great story great villain like one or two like tiny problems that didn't take me out too much um and we now have uh, have a new doctor on the horizon ready to travel in the new tardis with a n new companion along the horizon as well and i'm i'm looking forward to seeing where doctor who's gonna go next so that's it for my uh quick review of all three a Doctor Who 60th anniversary specials, please do tell me down in the comments below what your opinions on those specials are, especially if I'm in the minority in regards to Wild Blue Yonder, because I feel like a lot of people really, really like that, and I'm sort of more in the eh kind of category. Uh, <laughs> yes, please do tell me in the comments down below what your thoughts on, on the Doctor Who specials are, what you're looking forward to in regards to like the Christmas special and the new series that's coming up with Shuti Gawa's Doctor. Do you think he's going to be a great one? Because... I'm having good good feelings about him. I'm getting good vibes. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you haven't done it already, links for social media and all that are all in the description down below. And that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see all of you very soon. Goodbye.